Would you bow with me in prayer? God, we thank you for this opportunity to take a day of the week to come and to connect with you, to reprioritize life, to find our center and our meaning and purpose and be reminded of who we are. God, we thank you for the way that you meet us in the bread and the unfermented wine of communion. And we thank you for the way that you meet us in the words of scripture. God, as I read these words and speak of them, we pray that your spirit would move and speak to us, draw us to you and connect us with you and give us what you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As Eric mentioned earlier, this is the second week in our series of sermons called Jenga. We've got the big Jenga set over here, and we thought it was just such a fitting analogy for life because similar to the game where you're taking pieces out and you're trying to build something but also keep it balanced so it doesn't all fall apart, we do that a lot with life. We have all of these various pieces, and they constantly need shuffled and and shifted, and we're trying to build something, but again we got to keep it in balance or the whole thing might come crashing down. Last week, Jesus, or I keep confusing Jesus and Julie. It just, they both, I did that a a couple weeks ago too. Last week, Julie (laughs) talked about priority and and trying to balance that. And this week, I want to talk about identity. That, That question of who am I and, and what is my purpose? Why am I here? And so I, I went on a little bit of, a, of, a, of an identity quest this week. If, if you've ever heard of a vision quest, it's kind of like that. I did that one time, found my spirit animal, Eeyore. And, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like that. But an identity quest, the, the question is to, is to find out, you know, who, who am I? And I realized I, I kind of like to take the easy way out. And so I thought, you know, maybe some of you have already figured this out and I could just copy And so I went to your profiles on Facebook and started looking to see what you said about yourself to see if, you know, maybe that could be my identity. And so I I pulled a couple I'll share with you that I thought, you know, might be potentials on my identity quest. I found one of you that said this about yourself on your about page on Facebook. I enjoy cookies or cooking and movies. I was right with it when I thought it was cookies. I was like, yes, that could be me. Cooking, not as much. But, but you know, there's, there's maybe something there for me. Uh, another of you said that I have a passion to serve others and ultimately serve God. A little bit of the theology and the faith. I thought, well, you know, that, that could be part of my identity. One of you said, uh, what you see is what you get. No hidden agendas. Uh, we talk about in access, about being real with each other and that, that resonated with me a bit. Uh, went to another person, one of you, who was, went into a little bit more depth. You said, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste, a connoisseur of hot wings. <laughs> Some things attractive about that as well. And one of you uh, had this bit of wisdom to share. Learn from your heart, and when that fails, drink tequila. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of, of who we are as, as the access community, but I I felt like this was probably not the end of my identity quest, and you know, if Facebook wasn't going to get it to me, perhaps I could turn to another authoritative source of information that has been shaping the identity of Americans and people around the world for generations, Walt Disney World movies. And so I want to show you a clip from The Lion King about identity. So Simba... He gets in this situation and and the heavenly voice of his father Mufasa comes and offers him actually several different possibilities for how to find his true identity. And I found this compelling because a lot of what his his dad, that that voice from kind of the heavens coming down and telling him are some of the same answers in our culture about where we can find our identity. One of the things that Mufasa tells Simba, he says, look inside yourself. And I encountered a guy on a plane one time, he, he was talking about trying to find his identity, and he said, what I really need to do is I need to get away, and I need to meditate, and I need to look inside myself, and that's where I'll find what I'm supposed to do and, and who I am. And so, culturally, sometimes we're told that that's where we can find our identity, that we already know who it is, but we, what it is, we, we just have to get in touch with it. But sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. Another answer that Mufasa gives in the same sort of scene is that his identity is found in his family. He reminds Simba that Simba is his son, and 
all of us have families, and we know that with families come obligations and responsibilities and expectations, and maybe if we just leaned into those and we embraced all the things our family told us we ought to be doing, maybe that would be our sense of identity and we would find fulfillment and purpose in it. Also, uh, in that same scene, Mufasa tells Simba that his identity is related to his duty. He says, you are the one true king. Well, that's, it's related to his family, but that's also kind of like his, his job. And certainly people have tried to find their identity in their work. It's where most of us spend most of the hours of our week. Perhaps if we just embraced that and said, this is who we are, we are the work that we do, perhaps that would give us a sense of fulfillment and a, a sense that we had known who we truly are. And yet that has some downsides. I read just a couple of blog posts related to psychology journals talking about identity. And they talked about when people find their identity in their work and it's solely in their work, that can function well until something happens and they're physically unable to do their work or they retire. And suddenly, many people who have invested all of their identity in their work, they find when they don't have their work, they seem lost and they don't know who they are. And so these couple of posts and articles I was reading said, maybe we should find our identity not in what we do for payment, but what we do for pleasure in in our hobbies, the things that we choose to do when nobody's forcing us to, nobody's paying us to do them. Maybe that's where we should try to find our identity. All these kinds of possibilities. And with each of them, I have a sense that there's some truth to them, but there might still be something missing. And so where I want to take you today in the scriptures is to a discussion about identity between Jesus and his disciples. And what I'm going to highlight in this scripture is another answer, a different, unique, and distinctive way for Christians to find their true identity, who we are and why we are here. The scripture that I want to read to you is in the book of Matthew, and it's in chapter 16. And I want to start reading in verse 13 where it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? Or who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So the identity question begins with Jesus asking his disciples to say, you've been around people, you've heard what they're saying, who do they say that, that I am? He's, he's asking, who do people say that Jesus is? And they give some answers. There's Jeremiah, who was a young man, a, a prophet who was a spiritual leader for the nation for the time. Elijah, he was a, a very special person, again, a prophet. He was one that, as the Old Testament tells the story, never died. When he became a certain age, he rode a chariot into heaven and, and never died. And so if, if Jesus is Elijah, that's a very special kind of person. Uh, someone said that they thought he was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a contemporary of Jesus that had been beheaded by the king. And so if Jesus is John the Baptist, there's something very special there. He's been reincarnated in, in Jesus. And all of these answers of what other people are saying about Jesus is that he is some special guy. Maybe some very special guy. And in fact, people today say the same thing. Even atheists will say that is who Jesus is. He's some very special guy. I went looking at a couple of blog posts by atheists to see what they were saying about Jesus. And some of the things that they said, well, he was, he was a great philosopher or a great teacher or a great role model. Again, all ways of saying he is some special, maybe very special guy. Now, the thing with that, it's kind of attractive. If that's who I say Jesus is, that he's some special guy, a prophet, teacher, philosopher, whatever, 
if that's all he is, because there are other special guys, that's a little bit attractive because I can kind of take what I like from Jesus and I can leave behind the rest. I can take the parts of his teaching that I agree with and resonate with me and the ones that make me uncomfortable or I disagree with, I can set aside because at the end of the day, he is a very special guy, but he's just another guy. But then Jesus turns the question to his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter gives an answer that it is in an entirely different kind of category in terms of what he says and in terms of the implications for Peter himself. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. By identifying Jesus as God, he's saying that Jesus is not one among many, not one guy, not even one special guy among many guys. He is the guy. He is, he's God. He's the one who was in the beginning and who will be in the end, the one who is there in the present, the one from whom Peter came, the one to whom Peter will return, the one in the present, as one of the scriptures says, in whom we live and move and have our being and without whom we don't even have life. Peter identifies Jesus with God, and that is a unique identification unlike any other kind he might make. But he also says this thing about Jesus being the Messiah. Messiah was a term in a a different language. It's also the word Christ. It literally means anointed one, and it's a term used to describe the king, particularly the promised king that would be the king to end all kings, the king that would come back and rule over Israel and the entire world. That is the Messiah. And the thing about a king or a Messiah is that is the one who has subjects who must follow the rule of the king. And so when Peter says, you are the Messiah, he's saying that you are the king, but more than that, you are my king. Peter is saying, unlike the, you know, a a special guy where I can choose what to follow and what not to follow and what to agree with and what not to agree with, Jesus is saying, this is the one king. This is my one king. This is the one I will follow wherever he will lead. This is the one whose teachings I will try to learn and I will try to live out and whose role model I will follow the parts I like and the parts I don't like, the parts I agree with and the parts I disagree with, the parts that are comfortable and the parts that pull me out of my comfort zone and make me uncomfortable. Peter is saying, this is who Jesus is, the all in all, my king, my leader, my Messiah. And when he makes that identification of Jesus, it opens the door for Jesus now to turn to Simon and say, this is who you are. In verse 18, Jesus comes back and he says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. It's not quite as clear in the book of Matthew as it is in some of the other books of the Bible. This person was named Simon until Jesus renamed him to Peter. Peter in Greek means rock, and so when after Simon identifies Jesus as Messiah, the son of the living God. That opens the door for Jesus to look at Simon and say, you are the rock, Peter. It's as if Jesus looks deep inside Simon and sees there's something that is deeply strong and stable. And in fact, if you read the rest of the stories of the New Testament, after Jesus leaves, Peter becomes a stable rock-solid unifying force that brings together Jews and Gentiles and, and allows the early church to grow. We don't know if Simon saw this within himself before or not, but when Peter looked at it, or when Jesus looked at him, he saw a rock. And he made that clear to Simon that that's what he saw, so clear that he actually changed his name to Peter. I think it works the same way with us. We each have an identity that is the truest, most compelling version of ourselves that perhaps only God can see. And if we want God to reveal that identity to us, the way to open that door is to declare Jesus as God 
And even more than that, as my personal king, the one that I will follow, period, with heart, mind, soul, and strength. That opens the door for God to look within us and to reveal what God truly sees within us. For each one of us, that will be unique. We read about things like spiritual gifts in the New Testament, and it says that God's Spirit gives to each of us abilities and things that are unique, and I think it's the same with our identity. We are each these sort of handcrafted, unique versions of of, of people. And what God sees in us will be different for each one. There will be something unique to our personality and our experience that, that is that defining characteristic about us. And God will be able to do things with us and through us that God couldn't do in quite the same way with anyone else. Now, now getting revealed that identity is, it's kind of a process. As, as we live and shape more and more of our lives to declare Jesus as Messiah and Son of the living God, God begins to reveal to us who we are. And, and it's, like I say, it's not a one-size-fits-all, so I can't tell you what that particular identity will be, but I can tell you it will be consistent with some things that we proclaim about the identity of the Access community. There are a few things that I can tell you as a member of the Access community that I know that God sees in you and and we have proclaimed to be the truth. There are a few things that I can tell you about your identity that whatever God reveals to you will be consistent with these things. And so I want to give you three this morning that as a member of the Access community, you are, first of all, one of us. Romans 5.2, the place we take the name Access, says that in Jesus Christ, we have been given access to the grace or the love of God. That is something open to everyone. And so if you are here, you are part of our community. Each one of us is distinct and unique. Each one has a different history, some of them a little more colorful than others. But we are all part of the same community. You are welcome and you belong. This is a place that God wants you in access and in the church that is bigger than any one congregation. You are one of us. You are also a work in progress. This is part of what we proclaim as our identity. Uh, We're all a little bit of a mess. Some of us more than others and in different places than others, but none of us are perfect. We are a work in progress, and so in access, we have choose just to embrace that and say, yeah, we are a bit of a mess. I am, you are, and we are going to be a community together that will be a work in progress. But because we are a work in progress, we are also, and you are, a person of hope. Because God is not done with me and God is not done with you. The founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, said that what God is trying to do in us, in fact, he said the meaning of salvation is that God is moving us on towards perfection. And what he meant by that was he envisioned a day when we might, even before we die, be made what he called perfect in love. Where we were so in tune with God that we didn't knowingly do anything that God does not want us to do. But the point I want you to take from it is that because we are works in progress, we are people of hope. Because it is God who is working to remake us into the best version of ourselves that we can be. Who am I? I'm part of a community. I'm a work in progress. And I'm a person of hope. And you are too. Last week, Julie challenged us to look at our actions and how they speak to our priority. I would ask you to continue looking at yourselves this week and look at what your actions say about who you believe Jesus is, particularly a special guy or the guy. And in the midst of that, I encourage you to to be still and to listen to see who God might be revealing that you are. But it will be a person of community a person that's a work in progress, and a person of hope. Amen.